right. <laughs> Hello. Hello, everybody. Um, it's my massive pleasure to introduce uh, John Ronson. We're incredibly lucky to have him. He is in the middle of doing five sold-out nights at Leicester Square Theatre, um, which he's just told me before. He's taking its toll a little bit. Uh, it's so playing havoc on my mental health. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he also is very keen to stress that whilst uh, you know, this is the current book, he's happy to take questions on anything and may even actually appreciate some questions <laughs> not on the, on the current book, um, sure. which slightly throws my prep. But uh, um, oh no, that's, that's fine too. Can I just say this is the most beautifully designed place, but I've, I've already discovered a, a flaw, uh, which is that too much hand sanitizer comes out. Um, <laughs> yeah, it, there was like a, there was like a kind of little mini pond of hand sanitizer. In my yeah, I know. yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, right, let's get started. We will wrap up at one because we know some people have um, have meetings to go to, so we have just the best part of an hour. Um, so I'd still like to start with a couple of questions on the book. Sure. Because um, yeah, yeah, I think yeah. that's, you know... Um, uh, it's well, Google gets a mention well, in it's, the book. Well, it's, it's the most relevant book that you've done yeah. in terms of, you know, the internet and, and social media. So let's start at the beginning. For those of you who haven't read the, the book, the book starts with this thing which John would call a spam bot. Three academics would call an infomorph, which impersonates John on Twitter. Um, it moves very quickly from a strange interest in fusion cooking, to dreaming about hashtag time and hashtag cock, which <laughs> not unreasonably upsets the man. Yeah. Um, <laughs> he interviews them, uh, puts, the, puts the interview on YouTube, and then the comments erupt under, uh, under the video. And in the book you say, you won. Mm. Why do you start with a victory? Well, because it's a, it's a, I hope um, that I'm using this word in the right way. Pyrrhic victory. Um, it felt, is that the right? Could be. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you need to say a bit more before I can qualify whether it's a Pyrrhic victory or just a victory. Because it felt great. You know, suddenly I say in the book, I felt like braver. Basically, these three academics created this, you know, John Ronson spam bot, which was being followed by people who I knew from real life. And, you know, who obviously, as you pointed out, you know, it was, it was tweeting things like, I am dreaming something about time and cock. So all these people that I knew from real life were obviously wondering like, why I'd suddenly become so <coughs> candid about dreaming about cock. <laughs> um, and, and so I had a confrontation with them. Um, and they basically said, they said something that at the time just brushed past me, but now I think was the most important thing that they said. They said, the internet is not the real world. Um, and this was in 2012, I think. And I think the, the that was like the, the general view in 20, like way back in 2012, <laughs> that the internet is not the real world. C could you hear everything that I said just then, by the way? Yeah. Okay, good. Um, and, uh, and also, they were basically saying, look, my identity is not important. It's like we, we're, you know, in this utopian new age, identities kind of belong to everybody. And that really upset me, and, I, and it upset me way more than it ought to have done because it was just a stupid tw Twitter spam bot. But it kind of got to a sort of profound mm. thing, which was um, our identity really matters. You know, you spend your life working out what movies you like, what you care about, what you don't care about. And suddenly all that was like, you know, hoisted away from me. Uh, and for me, it was like a tiny little ridiculous spam bot thing. But to, to leap forward for just a second, mm -hmm. the people whose lives are destroyed on social media, that seizing of, a, of an identity is, is profoundly traumatizing. Yes, yeah, so and maybe let's, let's move to that, because that's obviously the central tenet of the book is around those people whose lives are, are turned upside down. Um, mm -hmm. you st the next sort of story about shaming is about a journalist, a writer, who uh, is found to have made up some quotes about Dylan and others. Mm -hmm. and uh, he, when this story breaks, his, his life pretty much collapses, at least for a good while. Um, but there's an interesting section in there where you're talking with the other investigative journalist who found out the, the mistakes that he made. And he's discussing the actual pressing of send on that article, knowing what it's going to do to this guy. Um, and he describes the process as fucking horrible. Yeah. Have you ever had similar dilemmas on anything you've written about the impact of what you're writing? Well, it's funny, I remember he said to me, uh, this guy, Malcolm Ornahan, who discovered this journalist had been fabricated quotes. This was a big, successful Malcolm Gladwell type writer called Jonah Lehrer. And he knew that if he pressed send, he would ruin this man's life. For, you know, 
serious, you know, it was transgressions, real transgressions. Yeah, proper fake. journalistic errors. Yeah. But he hadn't killed anyone. No. But he was going to, if he pressed sent, he would ruin this person's life. And, and in fact, Joda said to me, uh, sorry, Michael said the same thing to me. He said, have you ever been in this position? Mm. Like, if you press sent, you would ruin somebody's life. And I thought, have I? And I said to him, mm, I don't know. <laughs> because, as, you know, because journalists are constantly playing psychological tricks on themselves to make ourselves feel not so bad about <laughs> bad things that we do. <laughs> but, I, but I don't think I have ever done that. I don't think I've ever ruined anyone's life. I mean, some people have been upset with me. Sure. Um, a number of people have been upset <laughs> with me. <laughs> but, but, uh, uh, but a huge number of people have been very happy with what I've written. And, mm -hmm. and obviously, those are, the, those are the stories I like more. Um, <laughs> what I particularly like, by the way, is, is when opposing factions both like what I wrote. And that happened quite recently with Katie Hopkins. She loved it, and the people who hate her loved it. And that's when I feel I've really done a good job. Um, <laughs> because I'm not about being a, a mugger. I'm about um, being you know, curious and finding common ground and, 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 and so on. Mm. Um, yes. Um, Moving through the book at some pace so we get time. Uh, we will take questions from the floor fairly soon. Um, we'll come out with mics, so do wait for the mics when, when we do that. Um, the shamings take another turn when you tell the story of two tech guys at a, a developer conference who get called out for making some jokes between themselves mm. by uh, a female attendee at that conference. And then the, the whole thing turns that actually she gets taken down mm. much more nastily, much more viciously than, than the two guys in the first place. Why do you think that happens? And why do you think it is that at the level of, of hatred directed at women is much nastier than it is at men? Yeah, I mean, there's no doubt that, that the range of insults is are way worse when it's a woman being shamed. When it's a man, it's... I mean, you get the odd... I was thinking those three academics mm -hmm. who I put on YouTube the comments underneath did include. Um, <laughs> so, they, so men do sometimes get, but, that, but in general, I would say women have it way worse than men. When, when a man is getting shamed, it's I'm going to get you fired. When a woman's getting shamed, it's rape threats and death threats. Actually, on stage last night, I asked Bridget Christie that question, mm -hmm. and, and she said, you, you in the crowd, Nick, can you remember what her response was to that? It you were too busy taking notes, I think, yeah, yeah. weren't you? It, well, it basically, that women are, are held responsible. Women have to be really good at a million different things. Like, and, and so there's lots, of, there's lots of, I think this was Bridget's explanation. So there's lots of different ways you can attack women. Women have to be good at sex, so you can attack them sexually. Women have to be good at homemaking, so you can attack them as a homemaker. So, maybe, but what, so that was Bridget's explanation. Um, what I, what I, what, what I realized is that, um, you know, whilst social justice is doing very well, there's also a huge renaissance of, of misogyny. And I suppose it's possible, I'm thinking on my feet here, but I suppose it's possible that the two things are, are connected, mm -hmm. that people who are against social justice um, are taking a kind of ferocious response. You know, men's rights activists um, battling feminists, you know, things have become very polemical yep. right now. So, so maybe those two things are connected. Mm -hmm. Another, uh, this comes up a couple of times in the book, that people say that they are now finding themselves being much quieter, you know, either on social media or even physically, mm -hmm. saying, you know, they're not risking jokes and they're, they're tending towards bland. Mm -hmm. And obviously, when you tell the story of, of optimizing, um, God, I've gone blank, the, um, uh, Lindsay, uh, yeah, Lindsay Stone, uh, you know, down the Google rankings, it's just a sea of blandness, of yeah. liking cats and, and other stuff. Yeah. Do you see that as a, as a risk, and do you see that that's happening? I do see it as a risk, but my argument is kind of an, is a nuanced one. Mm -hmm. And the one thing that really bugged me this last year was that a small group of people decided to be kind of ferociously and kind of actively against the book because they saw it as an attack on social justice, which it's not. And, and in fact, you know, these, these were people who hadn't read the book because it's impossible to criticize the book in that way if you've actually read it. But what this book is about, um, in terms of social justice, is it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a book against this kind of, what one person described as a cathartic alternative to social justice. The destruction of people like Justine Sacco is not social justice. 
it's this kind of easy, nasty imitation of social justice. So I think, so for me, it's very easy to make that distinction. But what's happening as a result of this is, is yeah, some people, because the attacks are no longer just on people who deserve it, mm -hmm. but also people who don't deserve it, although, of course, deserve is a, you know, I'm just saying that because it's easy right now to yes. say that. But there uh, are certainly shades of grey about who deserves it. Yeah. yeah. You know, a racist cop who shoots somebody deserves it. A woman who makes a liberal joke that comes out badly doesn't deserve it. Yet yeah. they're being treated with a similar level of ferocity. Mm. Um, literally. You yeah. know, they're, they're, their lives, both, both lives are being appended. Actually, the racist cop tends to recover a lot quicker than the PR woman with 170 Twitter followers who makes a liberal joke that comes out badly. Um, so, yeah, so as a result of that, as a result of the people with the power, i.e. us, abusing our power and going after everybody because we just love to shame and destroying people who don't deserve it, everybody's nervous. Like, it's a fearful time for people. So even when somebody's being shamed and people are thinking, oh, I don't think that person deserves it, um, nobody says anything. It's like, it's like the bully has taken over the school and, and as a result, people are killing themselves and... So I hooked Lindsay Stone up with, uh, who was this shamed woman, I hooked her up with Reputation.com, who was Google's enemy, Google's nemesis, <laughs> Reputation.com. <laughs> um, because they say, well, Google's not got the right, you know, who, who gave Google the right to, to basically uh, do, do everything, do all of this. So Reputation.com basically manipulates the Google algorithms. Yep. Um, I don't know how successfully, I think maybe sometimes successfully, sometimes less so, because it's a moving target, because... You're we constantly changing your algorithms, like Bond villains. <laughs> and um, <laughs> and um, <laughs> uh, so what, and, and what I found really sad was that, so Lindsay was this kind of audacious, nice, really nice person who worked, she worked with adults with learning difficulties. Yep. Like you couldn't have a nicer person. Um, and she did this stupid joke which meant nothing and was like destroyed all over the internet and was crushed. I mean, she read, her mental health was damaged more profoundly than anybody I met because she was a private individual uh, and believed, read every tweet, every Facebook color, comment, believed every single word. I mean, Jesus, I am a public figure with a pretty thick skin and it still you know, profoundly upsets me mm. when something like that happens to me. So for Lindsay, I mean, she didn't leave home for a year and a half. Um, suicidal thoughts, anxiety, depression, insomnia. Um, so I hooked her up with reputation.com. And the way they did it, as you said, is, is, was to swamp Google with stuff that would supplant this silly, audacious joke, which meant nothing. And it was blogs about how much Lindsay Stone loves cats and how much she's looking forward to the new Lady Gaga video. And... Um, what, what her favourite types of ice cream are. Yeah, just a stream of innocuous content. Basically. Yeah, and it, it just makes me think, my God, is this the society we've created for ourselves where the way to survive is to be bland? Which isn't to say, like, I, I say that from the perspective of a, of, of a politically correct person. It's like, none of this is me saying, let's return to a world where everybody can be offensive, because I don't feel that. It's a nuanced point. Do you think comedians have more leeway? I've not really picked up an example of a comedian getting slated. Um, Frankie Boyle, maybe, actually, mm -hmm. and now I think about it. But, you know, Justine Sacco says it. She says, you know, I'm not a character in South Park. I'm not a comedian. So mm -hmm. she had no business trying to attempt a joke. Yeah. Do comedians have a bit more forgiveness, you think? They have. Their, their stock in trade is to try and be funny and push some boundaries. They have more forgiveness because there's more built-in context. Um, but... I don't blame Justine. Like, I don't blame Justine for anything that happened at all. Uh, the tweet, for people who don't know, that got Justine destroyed was, uh, going to Africa, hope I don't get AIDS, just kidding, I'm white. And then she got on a plane, turned off her phone, and while she was asleep, she was d destroyed. Um, now, obviously, it's a terrible combination of words. Um, but the joke was intended, like South Park or Randy Newman, it was intended to mock her own privilege, her own bubble of privilege. Yeah. The way she described the joke to me was, living in America puts us in a bubble when it comes to what is going on in the third world. I was making fun of the bubble. I was rid So she was ridiculing herself. Um, now, it was kind of her own fault for not making that clear, but she only had 170 Twitter followers. 
nobody ever replied to any of her jokes. She was a comedian mm -hmm. in an empty room. And yet, while she was asleep on a plane, she became the worldwide number one trending topic on Twitter. She was Googled um, 1,220,000 times that night, uh, whereas the month before, she had been Googled 40 times. Um, so she worked in PR, which yeah. didn't help. Definitely didn't help. <laughs> and I'll tell you what else didn't help, the fact that she was blonde, she looked like, a, like in her Twitter avatar, she looked like somebody who had fun in parties in New York. So that, so, you know, misogynists hated that. Yeah. She really united a lot of disparate groups. Um, so, um, um, yeah. oh yeah, so, but, but no, so this is the thing that I found most awful about this, and I, and I thought the world lost its mind, which is that she was asleep on a plane yes. and unable to explain her joke, and not only did that not matter to people, people loved that about the situation. One person tweeted, we are about to watch this Justine Sacco bitch get fired in real time before she even knows. They were tracking the she's plane, they? They Yeah, <laughs> flight tracker website, yeah. hashtag worldwide, hashtag has Justine landed yet? Yeah, that's people, right. People were, tweeting, um, people were tweeting, hashtag has Justine landed yet? Maybe the best thing to ever happen mm -hmm. to my Friday night. Um, and so on. I mean, uh, we're talking 100,000 tweets that night while she was asleep on a plane. So the fact was, the the decontextualization of the tweet yeah. was brilliant for people. People loved it. And in fact, if anybody said, as indeed Helen Lewis, the New Statesman writer, said um, on that night on Twitter, I'm not sure that that joke was intended to be racist. You know, I'm not sure that this woman deserves what she's getting. Um, the response was, well, you're just a privileged bitch too. Calling for, for waiting for evidence was seen as pathetic weakness. By, by us. Yeah. Um, any questions from the floor at this mm -hmm. stage? I've got a ream of questions, and I'm very happy to keep going, but I don't want to monopolize it. Um, one here, Adam. Uh, can you just wait for Mike, please? Yeah. We're going to have this <laughs> slightly awkward pause with a microphone. <laughs> through, I'll try and fill. So, when okay. you were talking, all I could think about was that, you remember that landlord in Bristol? A girl got murdered. Uh, yes, and then he was just on the front of all the papers. It was like, he's a weirdo, he did it. Yeah. And actually, he had done nothing wrong. He was just questioned. Yeah. And now he's, got a, he's had to have a haircut, dye his hair. Yeah. He can't go out because people saw it, even mm -hmm. though they've convicted a guy who's admitted doing it, and there's loads of evidence that proves that he did do it. He cannot get this image, you know, mm. he because just cannot he didn't shift do it, it. Because he didn't do it, and he yes. was on the front page of every yeah. paper. So, like, it, like, the paper's apology was pretty poor, I thought, but... Yeah. How can, there's got to be a way that the internet can be used for good in reputation in some ways, because I was trying to think of ways that it's gone the other way, yeah. but oh, it's actually really bad that I can't. Oh, no, you know. no, there are, there's lots of good things that are happening. I mean, at the moment, I, uh, personally, I think the, the whole Oscars So White campaign is, is, is really positive, that's mm -hmm. really good. Um, it needed to be shaken up, and there's countless stories happening where, you know, civil rights movements are, are, are doing well because of social media. I mean, I, I can think of a million of them. I mean, you know, uh, Black Lives Matter um, is really positive. It's when, but as you say, so, so with, with, um, with that guy, that was the mainstream media taking a kind of slither of this person and building it into a total profile of this person that he liked poetry. He, he, was a, he taught poetry and- yeah, and it's all purple hair, and he taught them poetry, and so that obviously meant he was a kind of sex murderer, and um, <laughs> and um, what's interesting actually is that uh, this was I can't remember who said this, but I think it was Marina Hyde. Like I was being shamed um, around July of last year, and Marina Hyde said to me, the Guardian writer, um, it's funny for. Twitter purports to hate tabloids, but we are constantly acting like a tabloid. You know, we're constantly taking a tiny little sliver of, of a bit of information. And, you know, Twitter is the world's worst information swapping service. It's constantly getting things wrong. I mean, just yesterday, uh, day before yesterday, Kristen Stewart was being destroyed all over Twitter for something that she didn't do, for something that wasn't true. Uh, over and over again, people are being destroyed for something in the next day. I was like, oh, 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 yeah, no, that was wrong. But then, you know, but then th th nobody learns from it. We just do it all over again. Um, there's some tough stuff in the book. Um, you know, a number of people commit suicide as a result of the shame. Ashley Madison leaked victims. 
news of the world sting victims coming back to the press. We might come back to that. But probably the most harrowing is there's, there's a teenage girl uh, who's raped, and you detail her cross-examination by the prosecution lawyer, where he gives her a really tough time. Yeah. And this is a sort of a shame and humiliation in a closed environment, in a courtroom. Did you try and talk to the lawyer about he, how he felt? Yeah, I wrote to him, the guy who did the cross-examination. Yeah, yeah, John wrote to Carruthers, write, yeah, to name him. Wrote to him three times. And he wouldn't? No, he wouldn't talk to me. I, I, and you know what? I felt bad about naming him. Um, somebody said to me when the book came out, why did you name him? Mm -hmm. and, I, well, and I thought, well, it's a public record. Yes. Uh, but, you know, if I'm writing a book that's against shaming, mm. I shouldn't really be outing the shamers, right? So Interesting. So again, when we come back to that question I asked earlier about, you know, yeah. pressing send, yeah. you did think about that one a little bit. Actually, you know what? I didn't think about that until after the book had come oh, after out. After press send. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I shouldn't have named him. And in fact, if I'd thought about it, I I'd I'd could have taken his name out for the paperback that I was having. I was in the midst of my but own shaming, so <laughs> I didn't. But isn't there a potential then, actually, that it just drives more people to go and find out about it? And then you know, maybe then if they're online, they've, found, they've looked in public record. Uh. You know, it might, it might, it's the classic thing of Xing something out actually makes it more like the, like, like the Google, like the right to be forgotten. Mm. Yeah. I mean, when I read that thing about the couple having sex on the train, invoking their right to be forgotten. Obviously, like everybody else, I thought, oh, I've forgotten all about that. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, luckily in this book, very luckily, pretty much everybody, um, almost everybody in the book, is delighted with the way that they came over. And in fact, the fact that Justine's story became huge as a result of my book, um, Justine's happy about that mm -hmm. because it, you know it, it supplanted the old narrative with a new narrative, yes. which was well. so. And the same as Lindsay Stone, she's very happy um, that um, that the book's out there and people, uh, you know, are, are hearing you can sort of see her story. Her story. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, I I was reading the book on holiday last summer, and the son of a couple of friends of mine picked it up and devoured it. And they couldn't get it back for two days. He's about fifteen. And so I talked to him about it, and he said that he is very nervous about publishing mm -hmm. anything. Um, you've got a teenage son. Mm -hmm. How do you, uh, do you advise him on his social media profile? And um, he's quite, my, my son is quite unadvisable. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, um, <laughs> because he's so Well, maybe let's separate started. family then. Right. If you were well, no, but to, actually my son, when he was... If you were talking to a bunch of teenagers yeah. that weren't blood relatives, what would you say to them? <sighs> well, um, you know, in, in a talk I gave when the book first came out, a child psychologist came up to me in the signing queue. I was about to tell this story when that guy started heckling, mm -hmm. and I never got to tell the story on stage last night. Um, this child psychologist came up to me in the signing queue and said that every single, she said e either every single or almost every child who comes to her damaged now is damaged as a result of something that happened on social media. So, um, uh, you know, my answer to that question isn't necessarily a, the right answer. But when I think about the destruction of Justine Sacco, and I said this on Twitter, by the way, and got a ferocious response, mm -hmm. so I apologise if what I'm about to say mm -hmm. offends anybody. But when I think about Justine Sacco and people saying to me, I'm going to send your book to my children to show them, don't be like Justine Sacco, don't <coughs> tweet something that could be misconstrued, um, you know, be more careful. That reminds me of like girls at Saturday night don't wear short skirts. You know, it's, it feels to be like victim blaming. Mm. Uh, I think the people who should be changing their behaviour in the Justin Sacco incident are the shamers. I mean, you know, Justin was an idiot, and my God, she paid the price. But she was asleep on a plane. The joke wasn't intended. You know, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So th I think that's what I would say to teenagers. Like, you know, of course, don't be offensive. Mm. And I'm, a, as I said before, I'm a firm believer in political correctness. Like I, I remember in the 1970s, you know, on Saturday Night TV, it was it was wall-to-wall -wall racism and sexism, and political correctness has solved that. But but you know, so I'm not attacking political correctness, but I am saying that you know, don't don't be like Reputation.com had to be towards Lindsay Stone. Yeah. You know, be be audacious. 
be open. That's, that's you know, and and don't pile in on people. That's the behaviour. That's the change. key message. Yeah, yeah. I think, and, and always look for you know context and reason and curiosity. Take a yeah, context, nuance, compassion, empathy. Look, oh, ah, yes. Yeah, please. I hope people are enjoyed this. Very <laughs> much. <laughs> yeah, a, a question on exactly that, because if you look at an, sort of an anthropological evolution of humans, right? Everybody used to live in small communities, small villages, towns, bigger cities, and reputation was something that you had to keep amongst your peers. Mm -hmm. And whenever somebody tried to slander you, that could backfire to that person some way along the way, just give it time, mm -hmm. in worst cases. Now the world is your small town. How, and, and it has a, uh, that, that technology, technology has allowed us to become global very fast, which is something that humans haven't necessarily evolved that fast to handle. Yeah. How do you think that's possible for the for bullies and, 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 and just the mentality and the way that humans behave to evolve? Yeah, I mean, uh, people have to, that. you're right, we haven't caught up, you know, what I noticed time and time again when I was writing this book was that we haven't caught up with the new circumstances. Um, so on Twitter, we like to see ourselves as powerless, but we are very, very powerful. Um, if we tell a corporation that we want that person fired, that person will be fired. I say in the book, we're like toddlers crawling towards a gun. Um, I, so honestly, the, the only, because I don't think you can regulate, I mean, personally, it's funny, if before I'd written this book, I would have been knee-jerk against the right to be forgotten, because journalists are supposed to be against the right to be forgotten. I, I, I don't feel that way anymore. I'm all for the right to be forgotten, um, for private individuals like the couple having sex on the train, because, you know, I've, I've kind of gone from being like a prosecution attorney to a defence attorney over the years, and now I feel like all defence attorneys do, that people shouldn't be judged by the worst thing that they ever did, unless it's mm. something so terrible that it, it deserves to swallow up their life. Um, so I'm all for that, but, but basically what I think is we need to have conversations like this, because every time people think in a more holistic way about um, this kind of situation, then hopefully when shamings happen, everything just gets a little bit more nuanced and voices back and forward, and that's democracy. Um, two at the back there, and one there. Um, whoever gets the mic first. Can I just quickly add something about the right to be forgotten? Um, that I really, I just thought now was that Reputation.com is a. They cost. They it costs quite a lot of money to get your reputation scrubbed. I mean, they told me that they were giving Lindsay hundreds of thousands of dollars in yeah, free service. Yeah. Um, whereas, so even though social media is a leveling of the playing field, it's still the multimillionaires that could afford to get their reputation scrubbed. So. The right to be forgotten is a more egalitarian more, version more egalitarian, of yes. yeah. Right, good. Who's got the mic? Yep. Um, no. So it seems to me that there's two directions that it can go from here. One is one that we've already discussed, which is that you know people become more bland, they become more innocuous. But it's perhaps the other, um, and I was thinking about this the other day, is that it, you know you're approaching a generation will reach middle age in the next you know 20 30 years who have grown up with this kind of stuff all around them mm -hmm. and are used to having all this information out there about them and have to recognize that everybody has some dirty little secret that is going to be aired in public and everybody has an opportunity to be shamed mm -hmm. and so it's kind of like mutually assured destruction and everyone kind of decides you know what, it's not worth picking on that other person because I'm sure I have something that somebody mm. could make fun of and shame in exactly the same way. Do totally. You, do you think I, there's I, a sense of it going that way? Yeah, I, I totally agree that that is the ideal. Um, of course, there's a... <laughs> and it might happen. I, there's a... There's a um, someone said to me about the Ashley Madison hack, though. This is slightly a tangential thing, but somebody who was pro the Ashley Madison hack basically said, well, all of our secrets should be out in public. And my response to that was, you know, there's a massive difference between being out and being outed. Profound difference. Um, so, and what I've noticed these days is that, I, I have noticed, like, sometimes the people who do the shaming most ferociously are, are the people who are, who are most afraid that the same thing's gonna happen to them. So we are shaming people. Like Jonah Lehrer got destroyed by the journalistic community, I'm sure in part,
because everybody thought, fuck that, but for the grace of God, go I. Um, so, you know, so let's get him. Like kind of Mayan, you know, like, you know, Mayan deity, blood sacrifice. Um, <laughs> but, but I agree with you, I think it's possible. It's happening, actually, again, I'm really thinking on my feet here, but it's kind of happening a bit in porn. I've been spending <laughs> some time in the porn community for this future, <laughs> for this future project. And a lot of women have said to me, a lot of porn women have said to me that, like, everybody wants to be in porn now. Like, and honestly, you wouldn't, the, the market is saturated. Like, one of the big problems in porn now mm. is that, like, millions of, like, 18-year-old girls want to get into porn. And so no, it's fi everybody's finding it really hard to build a career because there's this constant influxes of new girls. And that's kind of what you're talking about, right? When you grow up in a, in a generation where everybody's watching porn for free, it, it sort of destigmatizes it for a, lot, for a lot of young people. So who knows? Maybe where there'll be a utopian world where everyone's in porn. <laughs> 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 yeah. Linking smoothly. <laughs> Pia? I have a question, but it's, uh, is this, can you hear me? Uh, it's oh. quiet. No? No? No, sorry. We'll take that, that question yeah. first. Um, I've got a question about this bit, but I've also got a question about another book. It depends on what you'd prefer. Oh, sure. Yeah, thank you. What would you prefer? Uh, this book or another book? Uh, can I hear the question first? Tack. Oh, no, this is... Uh, so, so question about, about this book or your next... Or them is the other one I wanted to ask about. Them, because I'm doing them. a them talk tonight. Also, I was trying to work out which of your books would make the best porn title. I think The Many Stare at Goats is probably up there. <laughs> um, Nicely done. In, in terms of them, um, you write brilliantly about the, the Tottenham Ayatollah, who sounds like a, a bundle of laughs, but... What I wanted to ask is, is in the light of, of a lot of changes that have happened since you wrote the book, especially the movement of a lot of people you know, to Syria from the UK, is that, was there something darker happening underneath what was going on? Because it sounded so calamitous when you wrote about it, but it sounds rather better organized nowadays. Yes, um, or chaotic when I wrote about it. Yeah, I mean, I, I can't deny the fact that I spent a year with Omar Bakri Mohammed, um, and really we treated him as a kind of humorous we were products of our time, this was like pre-9-11, and we treated him as a kind of humorous buffoon, I suppose. Um, this kind of, you know, it was like, oh, what a lovely jihad. Um, <laughs> and I spent a year with him, and I got into scrapes, and it was all kind of silly and funny, and I remember he outed me as a Jew at his jihad training camp uh, in Crawley. And, um, uh, <laughs> and it was all kind of silly and funny, and... and um, and yeah, uh, since then, so many of people, so many people, including people who were literally at that jihad training camp, had gone on to become suicide bombers and, and murderers. And, and, I, and I was accused of missing the story. Uh, it's funny, there was a, a guy called Mike Wine from the Board of Deputies of British Jews at the time said to me, this was like 1996, said to me, the world has not woken up to the dangers of militant Islamism. And I was thinking, oh, Mike. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, there you go. Uh, however, what I would say in defense of myself is that everything I wrote was true. It's like they weren't putting on a fake, they weren't putting on a persona. And I remember uh, Terry Gross from uh, Fresh Air, which is a big American radio show, uh, asked me that question, said, you were wrong, weren't you? And I said, or oh, that's in my paranoid imagination, <laughs> what she said, and she might have said something a bit nicer than that. Um, and, and I said that, it's like, you know, you can be a buffoon and you can still fly a plane into a building. So I don't feel that what we did was, was, was wrong. And you could argue that it's, it, it was, it's valuable because it was capturing that moment in time just before everything started to, to turn horrific. Thank you. Pia. Um, I have a question that's not fully formulated, and it's really more observations that confuse me, and I was wondering if you have thoughts on them. Okay. So when I was growing up, I felt like there was a kind of understanding of an elite and then kind of the masses. Mm. And I read books like 1984 and Brave New World, <coughs> and, and now you, of course, are talking about how there's almost like this move in 
society towards a more private society, so where we're governed by our own laws and you, gay people can marry and everyone's equal and everyone can basically do whatever they want. Mm. But then we have social media, which is introducing this <coughs> new public shaming, which again is giving back the power to the masses to say, if you're not like me, you're going down. Mm. And then we have this, the daily news sheets that are now daily and weekly, which we didn't have before, saying celebrities, they're just like us, they have cellulite like us, they cheat like us. So it's kind of trying to create a level playing field, but mm. where everything is based on the lowest common denominator rather than the highest common denominator. Mm. And you have people like the Kardashians who are our new elite, and like you're saying, lots of girls who want to go into porn, or lots of people on Instagram being extremely narcissistic about posting 10 selfies a day. Mm. Do you, where do you think we're heading with this, basically? And do you think it's time that we have a new elite, or how do we construct an elite out of the masses what is happening, basically? Well, actually, <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I'd be reasonably confident you haven't been asked that question before. <laughs> I, I haven't been asked that question before. However, that question does um, speak to something which I think I'm heading into in, my, in, future, in a future project of mine. And the truth is, I think it's, it's, it's interesting that you asked that question, where we are sitting right now, Google, because there, there is a new elite. Um, I say in the book, um, I asked an internet economist to try and work out for me how much money Google made out of the destruction of Justine Sacco. Um, and, and, and the figure they came back with, they said the conservative figure they came back with was $120,000 um, Google made out of Justine's annihilation that night. And, and please don't ask me to, to say how they got their calculations, because I honestly can't remember, um, although it's in the book. Um, Whereas, of course, those of us doing the actual shaming, uh, we got nothing. So we were unpaid shaming interns <laughs> for Google and, <laughs> and Twitter. And so there is an elite. I mean, that, and it's, it's Silicon Valley. Um, that is the elite. It's, you see it happening um, with Apple Music, with Spotify, with Google, with Twitter, to a lesser extent, um, and other companies which I'm looking at for my next project. Uh, which I don't want to name because I don't want to give away what it is. Um, so there is an elite. We are all, we are all drones working <laughs> for this new elite. So what you're saying is, is that instead of an elite of intellectuals, for instance, as we had before, we now have the elite that has created tools of mass distribution, tools of mass publication, and that is the elite because they've given the power to the people? Yeah, and people don't care. And why do people not care? Because they're getting everything for free on the internet. Do you think there's, uh, you know, because you, you approached Twitter when the spam bot was up, do you think there is more of a role that the, the media companies should be taking? Oh, Jesus, yeah. Twitter, I think, has behaved, honestly, I mean, I hate to say this, I think Twitter has behaved despicably. Um, at one point, somebody set up, because of the kind of ferocious response towards my book from a very, very small number of people who hadn't read my book, um, somebody set up a fake John Ronson account in which I was, I was praising um, the white supremacist who killed those people in South Carolina, um, Dylan Roof. And so I, for the first and only time in my life, I complained to Twitter, and I got a letter back saying, this is not in violation of our impersonation policy. Um, and then that was it. They kind of shut me off. So, you know, I just felt this kind of rage. Sure. That, you know, we are unpaid shaming interns for mm -hmm. a company that doesn't give a flying fuck about us. Uh, we'll come here, Rob, I think. Yep. Okay. Kind, of, uh, kind of following on from the previous point, mm -hmm. in, that, in, in that example, you know, media companies, and in particular tech companies like Google, do a lot to distance themselves from those kind of moral scenarios because we just provide the tools and it's up to people themselves to govern how they use it. Do you think that there is a uh, potential future where not necessarily tech companies, but just there is a, a higher uh, kind of moral arbiter which needs to be appealed to? Because in, in the previous scenario, it was the, the intellectuals and, and you mm -hmm. would appeal to those people who were seen as the, the wizened elders of the clan. Mm -hmm. Now, although the power has been concentrated into different hands, it seems like those companies in this case, are less willing to take that standard. Yes, and, and they absolutely 
should take that standard. Um, and I'm not really talking about regulation. As I say, I, I happen to think the right to be forgotten is a good thing. Um, and you can, of course, regulate against trolls who use kind of extreme language. You can't regulate against the millions of people who destroyed Justine Sacco because they were like nice people like us trying to do good. It was trying to be compassionate that led so many people to you know, commit the profoundly uncompassionate act of destroying Justine while she was asleep on a plane. So, um, so I don't think regulation is the answer. But I do think responsibility. I mean, I, th I think Twitter, honestly, I think Twitter is acting so idiotically in the way that it's seeming like this kind of untouchable, uncaring elite hiding behind libertarianism. Because people's lives constantly are getting upended on Twitter. Um, and, you know, for Twitter to sort of take this detached view, you know, much of, you know, getting that letter that I got, this is not, mm -hmm. yeah, I, and I, I wrote back and I said, why not? Mm. And they, they never replied. But we, but we are yeah. definitely, we do the same thing on, on YouTube and Facebook. They're all not responsible for the content that's posted. Mm. So would you say that you're, you would advocate companies rather than, rather than governments? Yes. Kind of not censoring, but like at least providing stricter guidelines as to what's content. Definitely, what posted. definitely. I think it's I think it's top down. I, I really do. Um, there's really unexpected websites can be really vicious, um, like Mumsnet. Um, <laughs> and um, I mean, I know it's tough to have a young kid, but still, you don't need to like take it out of me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, um, and I think in a situation like that, it's absolutely incumbent on the people who run the message boards to, to create uh, an ambience that means that people don't feel as, as, as um, you know, ready to just destroy. Uh, and The Guardian does it. I mean, I, I they moderate pretty yeah, heavily, don't they? Yeah, and, and good. Um, mm. I, I think, and honestly, you know, my views change since I've A, got older and B, um, done this book about public shaming and also the psychopath book, where I think, yeah, you know, I don't believe in just sort of everybody doing whatever the hell they want. The internet is not the real world. The internet is the real world. And so I'm, I am all for people taking a heavy hand like The Guardian does. Brilliant. Uh, we've got a question over here and then we'll have maybe two or three more. Uh, so I've got two questions. One's really easy to answer, and then one's sort of more of an opinion. Uh -huh. um, the first one is that Them was, was a really good book when it came out, and I found it really interesting. And I'd be really interested to know if you're looking to... I'd love to hear some of those stories now, kind of 10, 15 years later, like Alex Jones and things. Everything's a conspiracy. Whatever happens is clearly a yeah. conspiracy theory. Well, like, Alex Jones is clearly friends with Donald Trump. I mean, it's well, that was my second question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so, and, 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 and I wondered if you had any plans to go back and write you know, like a sequel or a new one to see about those people. And... Second question was more about, in light of that, what do you think of things like Donald Trump and more so much Jeremy Corbyn over here, where kind of they're not political people, they're not necessarily even loved by the press, but they seem to be hugely popular and hugely successful and are probably going to win nominations and things. And mm. that probably wouldn't have happened 10, 15 years ago, whereas it can now. Yeah, it kind of all feels like part of the same thing, right? This kind of, you know, um, on social media, it's like a kind of stage for constant artificial high dramas where everybody's either this kind of magnificent hero or the sickening villain. And the nuanced middle ground has become unfashionable. Um, Barbara Ellen wrote this really nice piece in The Guardian. I should say, I've been living in New York for the last three or four years, so I'm, I'm really not qualified to talk about Jeremy Corbyn. Like, from where I'm standing, um, some of the things he said, I think that seems like a very good idea. Um, I don't see the point of Trident, for instance. Um, but when Barbara Ellen left the, the Labour Party, she wrote a column in The Observer where she said, when did being moderate become such a dirty word? Um, and yeah, and, and so it's sort of, it's bleeding out of social media into politics with Trump and with Corbyn. And, and for me, as a kind of moderate who just wants everything to be reasonable, it's sort of <laughs> nightmarish. Um, <laughs> and in terms of your first question, uh, I don't think I would go back because I've just noticed that the only way I get to tell stories is when I don't, it's, I like to go into a world that I don't know and don't understand and try and solve the mystery. Once I feel like I understand the world, I, I, I no longer have any interest in it. And that, that's what happened to me with the conspiracy world in, in them. It's like, I feel like I kind of get Alex Jones. Mm -hmm. It is, Alex Jones is an interesting case though because suddenly he has power, like he, 
it, it, it seems like he's influencing Donald Trump, which is incredible that this kind of guy who we star spotted like 15, 20 years ago, this kind of crazy conspiracy guy, suddenly seems to actually have power. Um, but in general, I wouldn't go back and read a story for that reason. Um, We've got a question right over here, and then I'll come to you. Thanks very much. I don't know if anyone saw Troll Hunters last night, with presented by M. Ford, who is one of YouTube's favorite anti-troll right. people. She did the You Look Disgusting video that got over 17 million views, and it um, showed her putting on her makeup with responses to comments she got that went from very negative to very positive. So in this documentary, she went and interviewed trolls who had led to suicide of specific um, people by their comments. Mm -hmm. And no matter how much she tried to reason with them, these people were never going to change. They were like, we don't care. We feel like we win every time you respond. So my question is, for these trolls, is do you want our silence, which we often construe as ignoring something and taking the moral high ground because we don't want to feed the trolls? Mm -hmm. Is that silence a moral high ground from people who don't engage in this? Or do you feel like we should be challenging them and creating more debate for people like Justine? Should be torn apart more because the trolls will want us to respond? Mm -hmm. Is silence a moral high ground or is it um, kind of being complicit in their life being torn apart? I don't think there's a good answer. <laughs> no, I hear what you're saying. Although what I would say is that I don't think that this public shaming book is a, is a book about trolls. I think trolls are like a kind of extreme, ridiculous, kind of ludicrous minority. Um, whereas, you know, if Justine had been powered into just by trolls, I think her story would have gone away very quickly. Because there are a lot of crazy trolls, you know, misogynistic idiots. And there certainly were a smattering of misogynistic idiots. I mean, somebody that night wrote, um, somebody HIV positive should rape this bitch and then we'll find out if her skin colour protects her from AIDS. But that's kind of, I mean, that's horrific, but it wasn't trolls who failed Justine, it was, it was us. It was lovely people like us. So I suppose the answer to your question is, as far as I'm concerned, um, the dialogue should be with us. Reasonable, compassionate people who started acting kind of like trolls, not ridiculous, you know, clowns. And then this question over here. Yeah. Um, just w wanted to ask if you think that all of this shaming is, is because of most of humanity, deep inside, sadly, feel safer and easier when somebody else is in a worse situation than they are. Mm. And social media just enabling it where in the past they were just able to read it in the newspapers. So do you think it's because of that? And is there any way to fix it? Yeah, no, you're right. And I, and I noticed this for the first time when I was writing The Psychopath Test, which is an earlier book, where I met this um, researcher who used to work on the kind of daytime TV shows where everybody would scream at each other. And she told me that she had a secret trick that she would utilize when deciding which guests to book for the show. And the secret trick was that she would ask them what medication they were on. And if they were on a medication for something scary sounding like lithium, uh, she said, I wouldn't have them on the show because you don't want them to go on the show and then go off and kill themselves. But if it was a medication for a kind of fun-sounding mental illness like Prozac, um, <laughs> she said, that's kind of perfect. So, and of course, that's what she's doing. It's like we're putting people on television who are a little bit crazier than we are, not so crazy that we feel bad about it. Um, she said to me, we want... We, want, we don't want real exploitation. We don't want overt exploitation. We want smoke and mirrors exploitation. Um, and yes, we want people who are just a bit crazier than we are, so we feel a bit happier about ourselves, a little bit less crazy, um, but not so crazy that we feel bad about it. One last question yeah. here. Hi. Um, I thought that was really interesting, what you were saying about women getting shamed get way worse kind of insults and then i started thinking is it more likely a woman to shame or a man i mean are women more into shaming or are men more into shaming or is there no kind of um correlation and then i was thinking about the psychopath test and how i recall it i remember one woman who had like mental health problems who was in a basement and like smeared shit on the wall but i don't remember you talking about any female psychopaths mm. and then i started thinking um <laughs> Is it a male thing? 
to be a psychopath. <laughs> because, it, because maybe women have more empathy or something, so we're less likely to be a psychopath. Well, I've got a, I've got a kind of anecdotal answer to that second question, which was there used to be, there aren't any more, there used to be these treatment centres in Britain called DSPD units, which were basically treatment centres for psychopaths. Um, dangerous DSPD means dangerous and severe personality disorder. And I think, I'm kind of going back into my memory here, but I think there were five of them in Britain and four were for men and one was for women. So maybe that's a kind of anecdotal way to show the, the breakdown between male and female psychopaths. Why, I really don't know. I, and I should also add that in my public shaming book, the, prob the, the, the problem with people who are really into psychopathy diagnoses sometimes is that they don't really, they're not really that interested in what happened to the person as a child to make them that way. Whereas in this book, I talk about a psychiatrist called James Gilligan who comes to the conclusion that all violence is an attempt to replace shame with self-esteem. So I and so he believes that, that some people who are diagnosed as psychopaths are actually not. They're people who are trying to replace shame with self-esteem. Um, oh, and the male and female thing. Um, you know, honestly, I, my guess, and also a little bit from personal experience, because I had a, some waves of shaming over the course of 2015 as a result of this book from people who hadn't read the book. I don't yep. know if I mentioned that. <laughs> um, <laughs> it was, I didn't notice any gender differences. A hell of a lot of women were mean to me. <laughs> <laughs> um, we are, I'm afraid, out of time. We could clearly go on for a very long time. John. Can I just say, I, I, I aim to end every talk with a hell of a lot of women were mean to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've ticked that box then. So. Um, I would like to thank Rob and Nick for putting it on, but most of all, I'd like to thank John for giving up an hour to come in. Thank you very much.